300 billion is what they owe, and this is all manageable. Fiscal policy, super accommodative, will not last forever. We have climate to address. The sell-off yesterday was a clear crack in the uptrend. Uh, we're ripe for a correction. This is Bloomberg Surveillance, early edition with Francine Lacroix. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition on this Wednesday, the 22nd of September. I'm Francine Lacqua here in London, and here's what's coming up on today's program. Evergrande investors breathe a small sigh of relief. The indebted developer will repay yuan bond interest due tomorrow, but there's a dollar coupon to pay as well. Most Asian stocks fall as China plays catch-up. Will U.S. futures fluctuate? European equities gain ahead of today's Fed decision. The FOMC is expected to signal a reduction in stimulus later today. And live from the Goldman Sachs Berenberg Conference, we'll be joined this hour by Goldman's Wolfgang Fink and Fresenius Chief Executive Stefan Sturm. We're four days away from the German election as well. So we're getting a bit of breaking news, and this is particularly important ahead of the election. It's IFO. IFO actually cutting their German 2021 GDP growth forecast from 2.5% or 2.5% from 3.3%. So it is actually quite a big drop, the new forecast compared to the old forecast. That could give us an indication of the anxiousness that we're seeing amongst German voters ahead of the election on Sunday. Now, the German 22 growth forecast has also, uh, though, risen to 5.1% from 4.3%. We had a great conversation with the EFO president, of course, on some of the supply chain disruption, but also some of the rollout, for example, on infrastructure. Now, I don't know whether this is playing onto the markets as a whole, but certainly if you look at the markets, they're relieved a little bit that we saw a bit of cash injection coming from PBOC on Evergrande after the huge sell-off, the wall of worry that we had on Monday. Markets today Feeling a little bit better about the future. Again, uh, there's a lot of worries and a lot of questions on Evergrande and what the implication, for example, means for some of the banks in Wall Street. But overall, a little bit of green. You can see with uh, the FTSE 0.5, 0.7%. We're talking uh, through Bloomberg sources about the UK also joining a trade deal. And you can see uh, the CAC 40 gaining some 0.7% amongst the groups that are losing the most, I have to say, it's the ones exposed to China, miners, luxury, for example. And then, of course, we have the Fed today, the big one, that could reprice some of the markets. Now, only four days to go until Germany's general election, and the Chancellor, Angela Merkel, has joined the campaign to give CDU candidate Armin Laschet a last-minute boost. Now, after a disastrous campaign, the German Conservatives are betting they can still narrow the gap with the Social Democrats to win the election. It's one of several sources of uncertainty for Europe's largest economy, as well well as the pandemic recovery and the nascent issue of ballooning gas prices. Well, joining us now is Wolfgang Fink. He's chief executive for Germany at Goldman Sachs. Wolfgang is hosting the Goldman Sachs Berenberg 10th German corporate conference this week. So, Wolfgang, thank you so much for joining us right here on Bloomberg Surveillance. Thank you for having Early me. Edition. When you speak to chief executives in Germany, when you speak to, I guess, you know, companies and uh, executives that need to deal with supply chain issues, what are they asking of the next government? Well, I think um, we clearly have, um, Germany has and its industry has navigated the pandemic pretty well. Um, and we are now in this cyclical upswing phase um, as uh, more and more COVID sensitive sectors are opening. So clearly managing the current business <clears throat> and um, the, the supply chain <clears throat> challenges that uh, you were mentioning uh, is <clears throat> front and center. But talking about longer term challenges, clearly um, the modernization, the digitization of the economy, uh, the balancing of the green transformation um, for the German economy, the topic of the global trade uh, wars and the position of Germany in between the US-China discussions are front and center, and a new government will have to address all of those, not yeah. uh, leaving out the demographic challenge that Germany, as uh, one of the uh, older economies in terms of demographics, is facing, and the shortage of skilled labor that is coming down yeah. um, the, the, the way as well for those corporates. But, so, Wolfgang, if you you know put all of that into question and kind of bundle it up, is there one or two policies that business, that chief executives absolutely need to see put in place? Is it focusing on you know the green transition? Is it actually cutting red tape for for entrepreneurs in Germany? 
No, Francine, this is what we hear a lot. We hear a lot about uh, the red tape that you that you were describing. Clearly, companies are struggling with that, and the cost of red tape to the to the corporate sector um, is is co is constantly increasing. So that's certainly something very high on the agenda. And then, as you said, the green transition and the cost implied, but also the question as to clear rules and guidelines for corporates to safeguard their investments that are massive into green transition um, is front and center. So that's what the new government will also have to address. In terms of infrastructure, and again, it can be a green infrastructure or it can actually be on the digital side, Wolfgang, how different are you expecting? I know everything's to play and actually the polls are changing and it's very difficult to know what kind of coalition we'll have and whether it will take three months to form. But how do you see the German economy changing in the next five years? Well, I think there are things that have to happen, um, and every government, regardless of um, the composition, and as you know, there are lots of undecided voters at this point, as, as, as we all uh, learn, and then also um, the question of which policies will ultimately make it into a coalition agreement. But irrespective of that, um, the digitization of the economy is a, is a daily um, sort of challenge for, for, for many of the actors in the German business. And so we will have to address that. The new government will have to address that. The green policies, the implementation of the European Green Deal will be an agenda that is a Europe-wide agenda that Germany will have to play uh, a leading role and will want to play a leading role. With. So I think it's pretty, pretty independent of what precisely the coalition government are. Those are sort of uh, general topics that will determine the next couple of years in the progress of this economy. What does Frankfurt, Wolfgang, actually need to remain a global financial center? I know we've seen also a lot of people actually move from London to Frankfurt because of Brexit. What are they asking? What does the financial community of Frankfurt and stock markets ask of the new government? Yeah, I think um, in particular, Frankfurt has a good starting point um, as it's how it is housing um, a major institution, as you know. But I think the, the whole question of the European capital markets, the European banking union, and a push towards that, in particular because of the financing need that the European economy will have with the green transition alone, a couple of trillions, as we think, part of the green deal will have to go into infrastructure investment. So you need functioning financial infrastructure in order to address that. Now, Frankfurt, in the heart of Germany, Europe's largest economy, is in a good position where the sort of the institutions, the regulators, and the governments can push together for getting these major initiatives going and push them forward. Uh, and that clearly will, again, enable a city like Frankfurt to thrive. And as we see more of European capital and banking union, capital markets and banking union come into practical reality. So that's number one. Number two, I'd say clearly openness towards international investments, which Germany needs to attract in order to finance many of those major transformations. And then thirdly, a, a business-friendly environment uh, conducive to new business um, setting up here, which I think we're seeing start um, a lot, lots of interesting uh, startups and, and initiatives going, but more push in that respect would certainly be helpful for Frankfurt. Um, Wolfgang, how difficult will it be for the new chancellor, you know, no matter who that person is, to try and fulfill the shoes of Angela Merkel after 16 years in charge? And it, we, we talk a lot about Angela Merkel, you know, bringing Europe together, uh, being a master at foreign relations. Is it things that matter to businesses? Does it matter to you how you run your business with a chancellor in charge? Well, I think that uh, in particular for um, the German industry, but also its financial system that we are part of. Um, it was very important that she was able to be as successful navigating the international relations. If you look at the German economy, and I'm only taking the DAX as an example, only 20% of the sales of the DAX 30 are concerned with Germany directly. The rest is uh, Europe, US, China. So. It's so important for this German economy and its financiers that we are part of a, a functioning international relation, uh, both in terms of political relation, business relations, etc. So, I mean, she had made an invaluable contribution to that. So the next government and its chancellor will have to fill those shoes as Germany is navigating increasing international tensions 
and still wants to play in these economies and with these governments and be sort of at the, at the heart of a European policy that integrates rather than divides. And hence, that will be a key aspect of a new government and chancellor. And if he or she succeeds, then clearly the German economy and its financial system will thrive. Wolfgang, thank you so much. Wolfgang Fink there, Goldman Sachs Chief Executive for Germany and Austria, joining us this morning. Now, coming up a little bit later in the program, we have a jam-packed show full of chief executives today. We speak to Stefan Sturm of Fresenius. We also hear from Maximilian Bittner of Vestia Collective and Enrico Vita from Amplifon. Remember, you can send all of these chief executives' questions. Just go into IB plus TV Go, or you can tweet me directly at Flacqua. This is Bloomberg. Economics, finance, politics. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacroix here in London. Now, the Evergrande pressure is easing somewhat, as the developer says. It will pay the interest due tomorrow on yuan bonds. However, the vaguely worded exchange filing doesn't specify when or how much of the almost $36 million Evergrande will pay. That as more investors have shot down the idea that this is China's Lehman moment. The Lehman moment pr produced pervasive structural damage um, through the system that the, that wasn't rectified until mm -hmm. the Treasury came across in terms of uh, its borrowing and then the Fed came across with quantitative easing. But um, this is not uh, that kind of a shake-up type of thing. This is, it's, 300 billion is what they owe and this is all manageable. Well, joining us now from Beijing is James Mager. He's Bloomberg's China economy editor. James, as always, thank you so much for joining us. So what exactly are we looking at? We saw a bit of a cash injection um, from PBOC. Evergrande saying it'll pay part of its notes, but actually many questions about the spillover of this if it defaults. That's right. I mean, as you, you said in the introduction, they, they agreed to pay or they agreed to defer, you know, this $36 million uh, $36 million interest payment that was due tomorrow on, a, on an onshore bond. They've also got uh, 80 something million dollars of interest payments due on offshore bonds tomorrow as well. It's not clear what's going to happen to that. There's been no announcement about that. But with that bond, there's a 30 day grace period between which they where they don't have to pay before they're actually in default. So, you know, that does leave them some time to, to sort out what they're going to do with that, with that interest payment. And as you said, the, the PBOC injected a, you know, a net 110, uh, I think net 90 billion dollars, 90 billion yuan into the money markets today. Uh, and those two things combined, the, the announcement that something had been done about this interest payment and that PBOC uh, liquidity injection uh, was enough to soothe China's stock market, at least for today. You know, it's, it's, it's down a little bit, but it, you know, it's, it's much better than it was initially. And it's much better, I think, people thought it was going to be after looking at what happened in Hong Kong the last two days. James, thank you so much. James Mager there, Bloomberg's China economy editor. Now let's get straight to the Bloomberg. First word news, here's Leanne Gerrans. Hi, Leanne. Hi, Francine. The Democratic-controlled House has passed a bill to suspend the U.S. debt ceiling into December 2022 and provide the government funding to operate past the end of this month. But Republicans have vowed to block the measure when it reaches the Senate over the debt limit provision. The political standoff raises the chances of both the government shutdown and a default, which could have devastating consequences for the U.S. economy. Now, the U the UK government is to provide limited financial support to restart fertilizer production at the country's biggest plant in a bid to ease a shortage of carbon dioxide that's crucial for the food industry. CF Industries had halted the site due to the soaring cost of natural gas. Separately, the government has met with domestic gas and power suppliers as several stopped accepting new customers as the UK energy crisis is escalating. Global News, 24 hours a day, on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Leanne Gerrans. This is Bloomberg Francine. Leanne, thanks so much. Coming up, we're back at the Goldman Sachs Berenberg Conference, joined by kidney disease specialist company Fresenius and its chief executive, Stefan Sturm. If you have any questions, just IB plus TV Go, or you can tweet me directly at Flacqua on Twitter. This is Bloomberg.
economics, finance, politics. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacroix here in London. Now let's get back to the Goldman Sachs Berenberg Conference and Fresenius is the world's leading service and treatment provider for those with renal diseases. The $25 billion company recently raised its forecast for the year after seeing benefits from its strategic switch up. But it still faces a number of uncertainties from the ongoing pandemic to rising gas prices and of course this weekend's German election. Well, we're delighted to be joined now by the chief executive of Fresenius, he's Stefan Sturm. Mr. Sturm, thank you so much for joining us right here on Bloomberg Surveillance. First of all, give me a sense of how the potential government shakeup after the election on Sunday could impact healthcare companies. We're going, we're, good morning, first of all, and thank you for having me. We are determined uh, to work with any government, whatever uh, the shape of it is going to be for as long as we have an opportunity for a rational dialogue uh, and where we have an opportunity to uh, bring across our ideas how patients going forward can be helped uh, even better. I believe there's quite a lot of noise in the various programs of the different political parties. Uh, I believe we are going to get a somewhat different and more re realistic picture after the election. Um, Mr. Sturm, overall, what do you see the biggest change in healthcare? I mean, we see a lot of disruptions, partly because of the pandemic, partly just because it's a business that hasn't been disrupted as much as others. How do you see your industry and Fresenius changing in the next five years? To the degree that we are a service provider, and we are predominantly that in our dialysis, but also in our European hospital business, um, we have been talking about that mega trend about um, inpatient treatments gradually moving to outpatient treatments, outpatient treatments, then thereafter moving into a patient's home. That trend is still ongoing and arguably has even been accelerated um, by COVID. What we also do see as a uh, second trend, obviously, is more, a move more towards digitalization. Um, you know, we got to get closer to a patient, closer into a patient's home, uh, and with that also make um, the treatment of a higher quality. And thirdly, uh, there's a long list, but may I'll leave it at three. Thirdly, um, that we as providers can assume a larger responsibility, also financially, for a patient's uh, well-being. Um, the financial risk uh, of patient coverage that should be borne by those who actually uh, manage a patient's health. Uh, there were reports in the media, Mr. Strom, that actually Fresenius and you were looking at a possible breakup. I know you, of the company. I know you shot that down, that, you know, as speculation, something that you're not interested in. What would make you look at the possibility of actually keeping certain units whilst, you know, either selling off or spinning off other ones? Uh, Francine, I haven't shot that down at all. Uh, I have said that we need to be open. Uh, to review the group structure against the backdrop of an underperformance of our share price and uh, a very low valuation. Um, we, uh, I have to admit that, for various more or less good reasons, haven't been able to show more meaningful earnings growth in the last years. Uh, and against that backdrop, uh, a very healthy uh, group structure that um, served as well, that gave us very healthy diversification, uh, in the eyes of many investors, have turn, has turned into something that is rather excessively complex. Um, and so what we are doing as we speak uh, is uh, to go through ways, alternative scenarios, how we can still preserve operating synergies, also synergies mm -hmm. below the EBIT line in terms of saved interest and tax expenses, um, but at the same time reduce uh, complexity. Um, that but is a... Go ahead. Are you telling me? Yeah. Are you telling me that the current structure is is therefore possibly not the right one? It may well be. That is just what we're trying to figure out. That uh, that structure has served as well. It did not prevent us from uh, uh, getting a 20 PE. It took us to our all-time high as far as the share price is concerned. But things are changing, and therefore that is what we are determined to analyze. And I have committed to give at least an interim update as part of our Q4 results presentation next February. Mr. Sturm, we only have about 50 seconds left. How much of or how much can you mitigate some of the rising energy prices? 
uh, we do not have a major exposure to uh, rising energy prices at all. Um, we are, when it comes to cost inflation, are primarily looking uh, at sales, uh, salaries and wages. Uh, and also we're looking to some raw materials uh, that are pharmaceutical specific. Um, energy, we are well hedged uh, for the medium term and all in all mm -hmm. have a minor exposure anyway. Mr. Sturm, always a pleasure to speak to you. Thank you so much for coming on. Stefan Sturm there, the chief executive of Fresenius, joining us from the Goldman Sachs Berenberg 10th German Corporate uh, Conference. Now, coming up, we'll talk a lot more about, uh, first of all, markets, but also luxury, secondhand bargains. Isn't anything new? We'll talk about Vestia Collectif. This is Bloomberg. Grand investors breathe a small sigh of relief. The indebted developer will re repay yuan bond interest due tomorrow, but there's a dollar coupon to pay as well. Most Asian stocks fall as China plays catch up, U.S. futures fluctuate, and European equities gain ahead of today's Fed decision. The FOMC is expected to signal a reduction in stimulus later this year. And Merkel boost, the outgoing German chancellor, gives a home stretch boost to Laschet's faltering campaign. Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacqua here in London. So lots going on. It is Wednesday. A reminder, Wednesday. We've made it through halfway through the week on this uh, 22nd of September. So European equities continuing their bounce back after Monday's ugly sell-off. Evergrande spurring some fresh uncertainty in markets with a vague statement regarding tomorrow's bond payments. But a cash injection from the PBOC has also shored up sentiment. This comes ahead of today's Fed meeting where an updated dot plot could pay off for the Hawks. Now, we spoke to a number of top investors from the Greenwich Economic Forum Investment Conference in Connecticut to about the recovery, about inflation, and about where they're putting their money. We got hit by the COVID coming. Um, and so then we bounced back from, from that. Supply chain problems that we're facing is very traditional economics 101. I see over the medium term nine negative supply shocks going to reduce potential growth and increase cost of production over time. We are looking at inflation being more of a short to medium term issue. We didn't take as much risk as we could because we added we added value but not as much as we should have added. We're 24 7 buying and partnering with the market leaders who are leading digital transformation in their industries. A lot of the funds that we manage are taking much longer term bets. So we feel much less sensitive, you know, maybe to a change in policy. Let's go straight to Danny Berger. Danny, good morning. So it looks like the Evergrande sell off is over for now. Yeah, yeah. Good morning, Francine. At least for now, I think that's really key because there is a little bit of relief in this market today. But there's still a lot we don't know. We don't know the details of this agreement that Evergrande has reached with its onshore bond payers. We don't know what the offshore picture looks like. But in the meantime, when China reopened today, this is, of course, the closed price. First day open after a holiday, it only sank seven tenths of a percent. This is not that bad when you consider what happened in the Hong Kong market, for example, some of the U.S. China exposed stocks. So it's partially Evergrande reaching agreement. It's also the PBOC injecting some liquidity that at least now is calming investors. Of course, there's still questions that remain that might shake things up. But that means Europe can head higher. The S&P 500 futures can head higher by as much as half a percent. But Francine, where the real China relief rally kicked in today was iron ore. We are now back above $100. Uh, previously, this had sunk below concerns about uh, China curbing steel output. But again, I think just with these sort of brighter, more accommodative signs emerging from China, that allowed the metal to rally today. Okay, it's finally actually something happening with iron ore, which yeah. is not concerning news. What are we expecting from Fed today, Danny? Well, I think that there is this sense that given how dramatic the start of the week was, that at least comparatively, it might be kind of boring. I think what people are really looking out for is any hawkish shift 
in the dot plots, what that economic forecast might be from the Fed. And you can see that based on what euro dollar futures are doing. So if there's going to be any sort of hawkish tilt in the dots, this is really what's sensitive, what will show up. And over the past week, we've seen the third highest amount of contracts trading hands in euro dollar December 2024 futures, uh, the third highest in history. So you have banks like Goldman, TD as well, recommending that their clients put on some more of these hawkish trades. So whether it'll be a snooze fest or not, there's certainly some short-term posturing around that we will get more of a hawkish tilt from the Fed scene. Danny, thank you so much. Dan Berger there looking at the dot plots. Now, almost two years since the start of the pandemic and online shopping is now a force of habit for fashion lovers. Vestiaire Collectif, a pre-loved fashion platform, is hoping this lifestyle change is here to stay. Now, the startup has raised over $200 million backed by SoftBank, increasing its value to $1.7 billion. Now, Vestia Collectif achieved unicorn status, unicorn status earlier this year after funding from Caring and Tiger Global Management. Well, I'm very pleased to uh, be joined by the Vestia Collectif Chief Executive Officer. He's Max Bittner. Max, always great to speak to you and catch up on some of these uh, pre-loved great companies that are also being uh, in the sustainable space and helping with how much we shop. How has the pandemic changed the way people shop around the world and what does it mean for the regions you're now focusing on? Yeah, firstly, good morning. Thank you for having me. Um, you know, the pandemic had a big impact on the business from a couple of different angles. Firstly, you know, people spent more time at home. They were more exposed to, um, you know, what was in their closet. So, you know, as time passed by, um, they, they, you know, approached that closet differently than in the past. <laughs> on the seller side, people thought about ways how to monetize uh, their wardrobes. You know, many people faced uncertainty, not just on the health side, but also on the financial side. Um, and, and what people don't realize is how much money lies in their closets, unused, unworn. Um, you know, you wouldn't have your money lying in a bank uh, like that without it working for you in some sort of way. But I think the biggest impact of it all has been uh, is, is the realization for all of us, you know, how everything we took for granted over the last decades can go away in such a, a fast heartbeat. Um, and, you know, the, the threatening global warming crisis that, you know, we've read about every day over the last three months in the summer, you know, with half the world being underwater, the other half being on fire, um, you know, shows yeah. that people need to act. And, and you know, our biggest mission and, and, and goal is to really help people think through changing the way they think about consumption. Yeah. Max, what's your biggest concern right now? So first of all, what will you do with this new funding? And we've seen a number of rivals also crop up. What do you need to get right in the next 12 months to stay ahead? You know, I, I, I hate calling uh, my brothers and sisters in arms rivals because, you know, our rivals would be uh, stupid consumption, uh, fast fashion, people buying more and more <laughs> stuff that they really don't need. Um, so I, I really see them more as, as friends than foes. Um, they're investing, educating the same consumers we're, we're targeting. So, uh, you know, the more the merrier. Um, my biggest concerns are, you know, I'm in, a, in a, an amazing place, which is getting a lot of attention right now. Uh, so execution will always be top of mind. And, and the second part and, and the main thing we will spend this money on is, is just investing in more tech. Uh, you know, we, we want to hire more engineers. We want to make sure that our platform becomes more easy to use for buyers and sellers. You know, we're a big marketplace, which is defined by the liquidity that we provide to, to people. So the easier they make, yeah. the, the better it is. And, and that's what tech is for. I mean, I know you're talking about stu stupid uh, consumption and, of course, extending the life cycle of a lot of these, you know, beautiful products that have been around either two years, five years or ten years. But how do you work around, you know, the fact that you're shipping that is not always in a friendly way? H how does, you know, the, your part of the industry reconcile with that over the next five years? You know, I think it's a fantastic question. I think that the, the main fact is um, when you think about an item being produced and sold, uh, you know, the biggest share of carbon emission comes from the production. The work we've done with external parties shows that if you buy, for example, a secondhand bag, uh, you reduce the carbon emission by 90 percent despite uh, shipping the product. Um, but we don't want to stop here. We're also challenging ourselves and we recognize that shipping products is our biggest source of carbon emission. Uh, one of the key services I launched since I joined was direct shipping, uh, where we give buyers and sellers the opportunity to connect directly and opt out of the authentication service that we provide. Um, this has been massively successful, especially at lower price points. You know, when you buy mm -hmm. a Birkenbag, you want to make sure that we authenticate it 
if you're buying $100, says Andres, maybe less so. Um, and, and we're challenging ourselves every day. We also announced about 10 days ago that we became a B Corp. Um, so really having ESG at the, at the front and center of our company is, is frankly more important to us um, than, yep. than valuations. So Max, what's your end goal for Vistia Collectif? Is an IPO further down the line something that you're hopeful for? Or will you get bought out completely by one of the bigger you know, luxury conglomerates? You know, I think the goal for us is to to stay an independent company, um, and and that's the reason I joined. So, you know, is an IPO somewhere down the line? Maybe. Uh, I think it's way too early uh, to think about that. You know, secondhand is such a young space, despite being you know a thousand year old industry. Um, you know, I like being private right now, and I like uh, being able to be as nimble as I can. What's your strategy in China? I know a lot of luxury groups are kind of reassessing, if not their commitment, their strategy there. You know, I wouldn't be doing my job right if I wouldn't think about China probably every day. You know, it is now the biggest luxury market in the world. Uh, but more importantly, it probably has the most sophisticated, most savvy, you know, online shoppers, especially on the fashion side uh, in the world. Uh, but I also recognize that China is 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 a big beast, uh, you know, from a competitive environment. You know, you have probably the most, the best. Uh, consumer-facing e-commerce companies in the world. So, so I look at it as a massive opportunity, but I also realize that it's a big challenge. So I'm, I'm figuring out my next steps. All right, Max, thank you so much. I hope you come back and, of course, update us on some of those steps. So Max Bittner there, the chief executive of Vestia Collectif, joining us this morning. Now, smart conversations continue on Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. Up next, has mask wearing made people realize about their hearing impairments? Well, we put this question to the chief executive of the world's biggest hearing aid company, Amplifon. If you have any questions for him, just IB Plus TV Go. This is Bloomberg. Economics, finance, politics, this is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacqua here in London. Let's get straight to your Bloomberg Business Flash. Here's Leanne Gerrans. Hi, Leanne. Hi, Francine. Evergrande's onshore property unit says it has reached an agreement with UN bondholders on an interest payment due on Thursday. The vaguely worded statement didn't, however, specify how much interest would be paid or when. Meanwhile, the biggest US banks appear to be sidestepping any fallout from the crisis. Citigroup says it has no direct lending exposure to Evergrande. Bloomberg understands and JP Morgan and Bank of America also have no such links. Now, Volkswagen's truck division Trayton has become the latest manufacturer to warn the global ship chip shortage is jeopardizing deliveries. Trayton, which owns the Scania and Man brands, says sales in the third quarter will be significantly lower than planned. The unit joins Daimler, Toyota and others in warning of a downbeat quarterly earnings season to come for car makers. DraftKings has offered to acquire UK gambling firm Intain in a deal worth more than $22 billion. Intain said it's considering the cash and stock offer for 2,800 pence a share. An acquisition would dramatically expand DraftKings' emerging gambling empire. Intain owns British bookmakers Ladbrokes and Coral. And that's your Bloomberg Business Flash. Francine. Leanne, thank you so much. Now, most people don't mind wearing a mask when they go out. The only trouble is sometimes it actually might be difficult to hear what other people are saying behind their face coverings. Now, those muffled voices you hear during the pandemic could be exposing a possible hearing impairment. Has mask wearing exacerbated this trend? Well, our next guest is Enrico Vita. He's the chief executive of Amplifon. Amplifon is the world's biggest hearing aid retailer. Founded in 1950 in Milan, Amplifon has a market cap of 10 billion euros. Let's get straight to Enrico Vita. Thank you for joining us, Enrico. There's so many questions I have on uh, hearing impairment on some of the products that you do. First of all, how has the pandemic changed or, you know, um, how have sales gone at Amplifon during those 18 months? Were, were people reluctant to get new hearing aids? Good morning, first of all. 
Yeah, well, uh, of course, uh, in particular, in the first phase of the pandemic, people were uh, uh, very reluctant to get out of their homes, uh, and therefore, uh, we also suffered from, uh, from, uh, from the pandemic. But uh, uh, what uh, it was uh, very, very good to see for us was that uh, just after a few months, when the restrictions to the mobility of the people were lifted, uh, we had the people coming back uh, coming back to our stores. So, you know, uh, hearing aid uh, is not uh, uh, nice to have. Uh, hearing loss is uh, quite uh, complex and uh, important uh, pathology. And therefore, uh, as soon as uh, the restrictions to mobility were lifted, we saw the clients coming back to our stores. Enrico, how does our relationship, of course, with all health, with how we hear, with some of the impairments that people have, how will it change because of the pandemic? Is there a new social contract, or do you think we'll go back to what it was like pre-pandemic? Absolutely. Uh, he, you know, hearing well uh, has, becoming, uh, has become uh, even more important uh, during the pandemic and uh, even after the pandemic. You know, uh, untreated hearing loss can have a devastating impact on the people's mental health and their ability to sustain relationship, and therefore on the people's uh, uh, quality of life. That's why, in particular, during the pandemic, when people was not able actually to meet with others and uh, to establish a personal relationship, hearing well was even more important uh, than, uh, than before. I know you have quite ambition targets and, you know, what you're planning for the 2023 also strategy mentions a revenue will be grown by a number of things organically, organic growth, but also acquisitions in France, Germany, the US and China. Are you targeting specific companies, Enrico? Yeah, well, we have some ideas, of course, uh, you know, uh, acquisitions have has been always part of our uh, model of growth, I would say. In the last six years, we have invested about more than 1.5 billion in terms of uh, acquisitions uh, in order to strengthen our leadership in, uh, in the marketplace, in order to lead the consolidation, which is a process which is uh, ongoing also in our sector. So definitely we will continue to invest in terms of acquisitions. You have mentioned two key areas of focus for us. One is the U.S., the biggest market in the world, and the other one is China, which is the, the fastest growing market in the world. So for sure, we will look at those two markets as a priority. So how much do you think you, you, can, you can grow the U.S. market in the next two to three years? How much bigger would the U.S. be? And do, do you worry about valuations? How much more consolidation actually will we see? Well, uh, we can, in the U.S., uh, definitely there is, there is a huge potential for us. Uh, the U.S. is by far the biggest market in the world. The value of the U.S. market is uh, above uh, 6 billion uh, uh, euro, and uh, we capture just a very limited part of this, uh, of this value. So there is a, definitely a huge potential for us to grow. We will do it uh, both uh, uh, organically, but also through acquisitions, if, of course, uh, the opportunity will arise. Enrico, I mean, g given some of the supply chain uh, concerns, you know, some of the concerns also in dealing with China, what will your priority be or what do you worry about the most to, to try and achieve actually some of those targets? No, uh, I have to say that uh, uh, as of today, we did not have any significant problem in terms of, uh, in terms of su supply chain. Uh, in particular from uh, our uh, suppliers of hearing gates. So this is not uh, a real concern for us. In general terms, uh, uh, we are very confident about our ability to reach the targets. Uh, we have done uh, in the past, the company has grown in the past, uh, uh, always uh, above market, uh, uh, very often double digits. So we are pretty confident about us uh, reaching uh, the targets that we have uh, uh, set for uh, 2023. Enrico, thanks so much for joining us. Enrico Vita, their chief executive of Amplifon, joining us this morning. Now, coming up from Evergrande uncertainty to the Fed's updated dot plot, we'll discuss the markets next with MLive's Eddie van der Valt. This is Bloomberg.
economics, finance, politics. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacqua here in London. Now, investors will be eagerly watching the Fed's rate decision later today on any signs of tapering, the U.S. debt ceiling deadlock, China's Evergrande crisis, and, of course, an extension of COVID lockdown measures may push the Fed's first interest rate increase back to 2024 or even later. Now, meanwhile, Bitcoin slid 40, well, below 40,000 for the first time since early August before rebounding. So to make sense of all these different market moves, we're joined now by Eddie van der Waals from our Markets Live team. So, Eddie, how much are you focusing on China compared to Fed? Yeah, you know what? I think there's, there's a growing consensus in the market at this point that the China situation will probably be contained, that China has the tools to you know, just just put a cap on this and, and, and provide the liquidity that the markets need that even if there is some sort of messy outcome, that they will be able to contain it. And therefore, the Fed will be able to focus on matters at home. However, the Fed will also have in the back of their mind that markets have been extremely volatile uh, in the last few mm. days in the context of how little volatility we've seen this year so far. And I think that will just worry them about spooking the animal spirits at this point. Um, so, so I think I, I think it will play on the back of their mind. Not so much the fallout from this, but just seeing how Jet Three traders have been in general. Eddie, we also had a wonderful interview from the ECB board member uh, Mattis Muller. I mean, what does this interview tell us about some of the dynamics actually facing ECB, but central banks in general? Yeah, that was a really that was a really insightful in, uh, interview, and I think that that that, he, that they're talking about you know extending QE as PEP comes to an end. I think that's really interesting. That really tells the market that uh, certainly from the ECB's perspective, there is going to be a lot of liquidity in the market for some time to come. I don't think people anybody expected the ECB to be a first mover here, but I think. You know, it shows that the doves are, you know, alive and well in, in, in the ranks of central banks across the board. Um, Eddie, you know, in general, we have the German elections coming up. Like, what are some of the bigger market forces at play? Well, absolutely. If we look beyond today's uh, FOMC, I think the, the German elections are absolutely key, and it's key for one particular reason. Nord Stream 2 has become an election issue. Um, and, and it's potentially in play because the way the math looks like now, um, the Greens and some other parties who are very uh, opposed to approving a Nord Stream 2 um, could, could hold the balance of power. Now, whether they will use that, um, we will have to see. But that could just you know, put a little bit of extra pressure on European gas prices, which then puts extra pressure on inflation, you know, which plays into the central bank narrative. And that's what it's all about. Eddie, thanks so much. Eddie van der Valt there from our MLive team. Now, Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition continues in the next hour. Matt Miller joins me out of Berlin. Uh, Kaylee Lines will be in New York. We'll talk about Fed. We'll talk about Evergrande. We'll also look at some of the Bitcoin dynamics there that we were talking about. So one of the things or one of the questions I have, which was, you know, it's probably at the forefront of Evergrande investors, is will they treat international investors so much differently than some of the domestic ones? This is Bloomberg. It's quite clear that markets and investors have become actually maybe perhaps a little bit too pessimistic. Fundamentally, we're still in the relatively early stages of this economic cycle. The question is, in this risky environment, how much do you want to be aggressive? This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition with Francine Lacqua, Matt Miller and Keely Lines. It's 10 a.m. here in London and 11 a.m. in Berlin, 5 a.m. in New York and 5 p.m. in Hong Kong on this Wednesday, September 22nd. Our top stories today. It's Fed Decision Day. The central bank is expected to signal a reduction in stimulus later this year with scrutiny also, of course, on forecasts. Well, signs of stabilization in China, Evergrande reaches an agreement on some interest payments as the PBOC injects more cash into the financial system. And the debt ceiling standoff, Democrats pursue an almost certainly doomed strategy to avert a government shutdown. Now, we do have quite a lot going on. And Kaylee, I guess underpinning all of this is relative stabilization on Evergrande in China. And we await, of course, the Fed decision. 
Yeah, not much at all going on on this Wednesday morning, Francine. Good morning to you. Now in Asia, I would note we did still have some closures for holidays. Both Hong Kong and South Korea were shut, but markets opened back up after a holiday in China and the CSI 300 did fall by about seven tenths of 1% even after the PBOC injected 120 billion yuan in short term liquidity equivalent to about $18.6 billion, really trying to ease some concerns around Evergrande specifically. And when it comes to Evergrande, we did get a pretty unusual, vaguely statement from the company about its bond payments that are due tomorrow on Thursday, saying that that has been resolved via private negotiations. Not really clear what that means, but that may ease some concern for now. Now elsewhere, we also had Japanese equities falling for a second day. We of course got the BOJ decision overnight. They left their policy settings on hold, but did warn about COVID related damage to the economy. And after that decision, the Japanese yen is the big underperformer in the G10 space, weaker against the dollar by about a quarter of 1%. Finally, I would point to iron ore futures in Singapore, a big recovery up 15% back above that $100 level, actually that $107 level now, maybe getting some easing of concerns because of that PBOC action. Now, of course, that's not the only central bank action we have to pay attention to today. We do have that Federal Reserve decision coming up at 2 p.m. Eastern time. It's not just about the language around tapering. It's also about the summary of economic projections and the dot plot. Now, ahead of that, futures are in positive territory. We're up about six tenths of one percent on S&P E-minis, but the bond market is just waiting and watching, going nowhere on the U.S. 10-year yield. We are steady right around 132. And then in the commodity complex, I would point to crude up 1.7 percent. We continue to see a tightening in inventory and we expect data to show that when we get the EIA report later on this morning. And finally, just pointing to Bitcoin, a bit of a recovery after three days of losses, Matt, the cryptocurrency up three and a half percent. Right now we're trading north of $42,000. All right, well, there's a lot of central bank action, Kaylee, actually um, behind what we're seeing happen in markets. Mattis Mueller, not to be confused with Matthew Miller, is a governing council member of the ECB, and he said that he thinks they should be boosting their regular asset purchase purchases once the pandemic era spending is over. So um, I'm not sure if that's fully what's behind. Obviously, we're seeing globally a bounce in equities, but that's got to add to your uh, good mood on this Wednesday morning. If you're long European stocks, we're seeing 1% gains again across the board, not back to the all-time highs that we saw a couple of weeks ago on the stock 600. We saw, I think, 475, and right now we're trading around 461, 462, but we're getting Getting there, and the 10 year yield is rising a little bit as investors feel comfortable enough to let go of um, that debt. You can see the euro and the pound, little change right now at 117.33, 136.41. But I think it's interesting you see the 136 handle rather than a 37, yeah. 38, or a 39 as we have been for the past few weeks, Francine. Yeah, Matthew Miller. I didn't know it was a Matthew Miller. Uh, yeah, of course, the focus is also on the fact that PBOC gave a little bit of cash injection to Evergrande, so it's just stabilizing the situation. I don't know for how long, but certainly at the moment, um, you know, it evaded or it avoided a major sell-off that maybe some traders were concerned about. Now, a look at what else is ahead today. The U.S. Food and Drug Administration may decide whether to recommend COVID-19 booster shots made by Pfizer and BioNTech. Then the U.N. General Assembly continues its general debate. This provides all member states with a platform to address the UN body. Today's main event, of course, we were just talking about the Fed's rate decision, 2 p.m. New York. The central banks is expected to signal scaling back asset purchases later this year. So, Kelly, it's all about the dot plot, the dot plot. Yeah, absolutely, Francine. Do we see the median dot pulled forward into 2022 for a rate hike? Also, we're watching the summary of economic projections and then, of course, any language around tapering. So let's get more on that with Michael McKee, Bloomberg International Economics and Policy Correspondent. He joins us now. So a lot potentially going on today, Mike. What are the number one things you're looking for? Well, you just mentioned them. Uh, we're going to look at the summary of economic projections first because that's going to tell us what the Fed thinks about the uh, path of inflation and the path of growth and particularly the path of unemployment. Is it moving fast enough to begin to taper? The Fed has not taken into account the inflation oh numbers. You can see there their forecast still very optimistic for hmm. 2021 and they think it's going down in 2022. Will they adjust that higher? And if they adjust that higher, does that mean a sooner 
uh, taper and a quicker rate rise. And that'll be the question about the dot plot. Do some dots move over from 2023 to 2022? It would take three dots to move in order to price in a rate increase for uh, 2022. And then, of course, we're going to be looking for Jay Powell to give us any kind of hint on tapering. Well, and Mike, there's so much going on right now that could knock the Fed off its course from one direction or the other. You've got the common prosperity push, the crackdown in China. Um, you've got continued supply chain problems. Um, you've got the debt ceiling issues. And yesterday, when Biden gave a speech to the UNGA, it seems like what he wants to do is double his spending on everything. So all of this seems like Jay Powell has a full plate of things to consider. He does. Uh, right. I'm not even sure what order you would put those problems in. And you left out one, man, and that is COVID. We don't even know what the winter course of COVID true, is going true. to be. So the Fed is flying absolutely blind. Bloomberg's Tom Warlick and Anna Wong pointing out this morning that uh, at one point, Alan Greenspan said uncertainty is a feature of monetary policy. And that's definitely going to be true today. <clears throat> Michael McKee all over, of course, the Fed later today. You can also watch our special coverage of the Fed decision starting at 1.30 p.m. New York time, 6.30 p.m. in London. Now, one encouraging sign for now, Evergrande saying it has negotiated a plan with bondholders to pay some interest payments. Now, Bridgewater founder Ray Dalio weighed in on the property developer's trouble. $300 billion is what they owe, and this is all manageable. The basic economics is for all countries in all time is that if your debt is in your own currency, uh, you can deal with it. You can work it out. You could work it out. We've right. seen it happen over mm -hmm. and over again. And it's a good thing that uh, uh, lenders get stung or that the borrowers get stung. Okay. That's how the system works. Let's get more now with Bloomberg's Tom McKenzie, a resident China expert. Tom, I guess the question is they can deal with it, but actually do they want to deal with it? So do we have any indication on the political will for authorities to really step in? We haven't had any communication directly from the government. And, of course, the question of moral hazard and trying to address moral hazard has been central for President Xi Jinping, Liu He, who leads his economics and finance team. And that is something that they're not going to want to walk back from. That, of course, is the overview of what's happening when it comes to Evergrande. What we do know, though, is that Evergrande has come out and they put out this vaguely, vaguely worded statement saying that they were going to make good on this bond payment. But this is the onshore bond payment. The big one to watch this week, I think, for international investors is the Thursday payment, about 80 million uh, US dollars, because we're starting to get a sense now that there is a hierarchy in terms of how creditors are going to be treated here, with domestic bondholders treated ahead of the US dollar bondholders. And, of course, HSBC, BlackRock, we know they and others have exposure there, Matt. Yeah, it looks like what they're trying to do is save uh, the Chinese market while, um, you know, ignoring the foreign market. And I guess that wouldn't bother President Xi's uh, common prosperity push too much. Probably not too much. I mean, there will be some, no doubt, within the halls of power in Zhongnanhai and Beijing who are saying, look, we've made good progress in terms of attracting foreign investment into the bond markets, the equity markets. We've got a stabilized yuan. We want that to continue to support the economy longer term. But the focus for now is addressing this risk around Evergrande, but the broader property sector and the question of moral hazard. You had the PBOC coming, of course, and injecting liquidity net about $18 billion, as Kaylee was pointing out. So that seems to be what's happening. The PBOC is there in the background. To provide that support more broadly for the economy and the financial sector as the Chinese authorities trying to work through what looks very much like a restructuring of Evergrande. Maybe not going to be a Lehman moment. Thank you so much to Bloomberg's Tom McKenzie. And of course, you can watch our special coverage of the Evergrande effect. That's this Thursday at 9.30 p.m. in New York, Friday morning at the China Open for our viewers in Asia. Now let's go over to Washington. The Democratic-controlled House has passed a bill to suspend the U.S. debt ceiling into December of 2022 and provide the government funding to operate past the end of this month. But Republicans have vowed to block the measure when it reaches the Senate. Anne-Marie Horder and Bloomberg Washington correspondent is with us here in New York. So Anne-Marie, if this fails, and it looks yeah, like it will, it will. <laughs> what's plan B? So it's going to fail. We do know that, except for maybe one senator from Louisiana who likes the idea of aid going to his constituents, given and all the effects of Hurricane Ida, but it's going to fail, and then we're ever so closely close to that ending of when we can fund the government and also the debt ceiling. The Republicans have already um, have their own in the Senate version of this bill, so it's basically to keep the funding going. It has also money towards the Israeli Iron Dome, which the progressives have taken out on the House bill. 
um, but it doesn't have the debt ceiling. So even if they were able to at least get to a measure in terms of moving forward on keeping the government operational, they still have not addressed the debt ceiling. So this is going to come down to the wire. But at some point, someone is just going to have to capitulate, and it's likely going to have to be the Democrats. They're going to have to do it with the reconciliation. Anne-Marie, of course, in New York, uh, the United Nations General Assembly, so President Biden urging the world to turn from conflict towards cooperation. We are not seeking a new Cold War or a world divided into rigid blocks. The United States is ready to work with any nation that steps up and pursues peaceful resolution to shared challenges. I mean, the word sounds nice, but then if you look at the French, they certainly won't forget being snubbed over the submarines. Yes, exactly. It was very much sort of very uh, diplomatic in his messaging, the president, but behind the scenes we have seen um, a lot of uh, grievances from Europe, especially about what is going on with America, as you mentioned, France, and we're still waiting for that phone call between President Biden and Emmanuel Macron. But the message, though, yesterday, really, though, Francine, from the president was winding down the 20-year war for Afghanistan, where the United States' future interests lie. He didn't mention China by name, but certainly uh, that is where he was di discussing that when he said this is not a Cold War, because just the evening before, the U.N. Secretary General Antonio Guterres said that the U.S. and China have a very unstable relationship, and that's where it is headed. It is headed towards a Cold War. But you make the point that many people are scratching their heads, that when America say they are back, do they really mean it, or do they mean America's back only? in America. All right, Bloomberg's Anne-Marie Horder and with us in New York, thank you so much. And now let's get back to the markets and take a look at some stocks moving in pre-market trading here in the U.S. One of the big ones to the downside is FedEx. Shares down about 5.4% after the company reported after the bell last night. Missed expectations in the quarter plus cut its full year forecast. Really struggling because of labor issues. That's raising costs for the company and you have shipment growth slowing down at the same time. So that's weighing heavily on the shares this morning. Another stock moving to the downside is Hyatt, of course, the hotel chain. It is issuing $7 million, million worth of shares in order to fund its acquisition of Apple Leisure Group. That's dilutive, and as a result, the stock is down 3.3% before the bell. One mover to the upside, though, is Rocket Labs, and this is after the company inked a deal for a launch in 2023 that's focused on the removal of space junk, so taking some of that debris out of orbit. There's a lot of optimism around that this morning, with the stock up the better part of 5% before the bell, Francine. Now, coming up this hour, we speak with Simon French, Panier Gordon chief economist. Uh, we'll talk, of course, about the Fed and Evergrande. This is Bloomberg. Great, thank you. No, I'm good. Thank you so much. Cutters. <laughs> Very soon Afternoon. to be in Berlin. Morning. Dude, when are you coming? When are you coming here? Yes. Uh, I'm going to be there, I think, October 17th or something. Oh, I'll be back. Good, 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 good. for a couple of weeks. I saw a really cool chart today, by the way, Mark, that shows um, Asian dollar debt spreads have not blown out, like, at all. Sort of not at all been hurt by Evergrande. I presume that's IG, because the high yield has. Yes. Yes, investment grade. Yeah, yeah the I, IG isn't, hasn't been worried at all, you're right. Are we going to do a play date in, Matt, uh, in Berlin, Matt? Because our kids are the same age. I have Edna's yes. uh, 11 months old. I want to see pictures, Mark. Hmm. Oh, she's 11 months. Oh, I thought she was about 17 yeah. months. Well, I, I, I didn't think they were exact same age, but I thought they were closer in age. Okay. But we have, uh, here in Berlin, we have four baby girls between the ages of uh, six months and two, two and a half years. <coughs> a good effort. <laughs> Wait, yeah. who else has a baby girl? Um, Patrick Donahue has a one and a half year old. Um, Naomi 
uh, has a two and a half year old or two year old, and Sarah Sara has a six month old. Rates in real terms are still extraordinarily low, still negative, and we're still getting reasonable profit growth. So I think uh, that, you know, if we get a 10% correction, I think fundamentally that's probably a good time to be getting back in. Actually, when you look at the technicals, you look at the, uh, the charts, uh, you look at, you know, the, the prospects that we're going to disappoint on the earnings front uh, because of the COVID slowdown, uh, we're ripe for a correction. Peter Oppenheimer of Goldman Sachs and Scott Minard of Guggenheim speaking to Bloomberg yesterday. Now joining us now is Mark Cudmore, Bloomberg macro strategist. So Mark, maybe you buy it if we get a 10% correction, but what's going to be the catalyst for one? Well, I'm wondering why we're getting so excited about potential 10% correction. We're more than 5% off the highs already. So it's just basically another week or two like last week. What could be the catalyst? It could be the FOMC as soon as tonight. That's not my base case, but that's a very obvious one on the horizon. It could be an extension of the European gas crisis, which really is going global and is squeezing more firms, increases risk aversion. We are seeing more bankruptcies in the UK by the day. And of course, we do have the greater China issues around Evergrande. Not that it's anything like a Lehman moment or anything close to that but just because we are seeing some more contagion we're seeing some more kind of financial stress there and just some more deleveraging so mark how much clarity did you get on evergrande and what does it mean for bondholders very little clarity uh, look on a scale of, of one to ten i think we got about three two or three and the reason i give any kind of score at all there is because we got a signal and that signal is no we're not going to leave evergrande uh in an unmanaged bankruptcy an unmanaged collapse now no one really expected that but there was a little bit of nervousness in the last couple of days in the holiday it was because of that vacuum that people's worst fears were allowed to kind of run amok with themselves so the fact that china came in there's a little bit of messaging there's some support Support the idea that look we're going to continue to continue to manage this we're not going to bail Evergrande out we're not going to make it easy but we're not going to leave an unmanaged bankruptcy so the tail risk has been removed but it still could be quite bad in the days ahead and it's exactly where we are in that spectrum that's important you know I'd say I, I interviewed Scott Minard yesterday and he mentioned a 10% correction, but then said it could go to a 20% correction. And that's where maybe you want to buy the dip. Would you buy, be a buyer there as well, Mark, um, considering that we've got the, the Fed uh, intent on tapering and um, Congress providing a little fiscal tapering, possibly providing a little fiscal tapering of its own? So there's probably several layers to that question. First of all, I don't think tapering would be negative. I, I know we're expecting tapering to be confirmed uh, for November is probably the most likely expectation tonight. I think clarity on tapering front would be good news. You know, you go back to the question on Evergrande, clarity is a positive for markets. If the Fed was derailing tapering again, it would be people going, oh my God, how worried are they about Evergrande? What are the concerns out there? So I think clarity on tapering would be very important. So I think if we get a shock from the Fed tonight, it's more likely to come on the dots. I'm not, again, I'm not expecting that, but I don't think we get a, a disappointment because of tapering. So the best message would be clarity on tapering. It's coming, yeah. but we don't get an aggressive top plot and dot plot, and therefore we get easing, stocks can carry on. But Mark, if we get both and move up in the dots and guidance around tapering today, has the Fed entirely lost its ability to separate those two things? I think they are struggling to separate those two things. And I, and I think it's a great question because you're right that if, if they raise the dot plots at the exact same time, people are, are going to even more struggle to this idea that there is any kind of distinguish, distinguishing between the two, the sequencing problem. Mm. But as I said, even if you do that, I think it's just a short term disruption. But, you know, Matt says, do you buy that dip even if it's 20 percent? I think the point is. I'm not convinced that U.S. stocks or stocks are going to be the leaders for the next six months next year either way. So mm. I'm relatively constructive on global markets if we get a bit, of a bit of a disruption. I would like to be buying the dip. I just don't think you buy the dip in the U.S. I think if the U.S. stabilizes, the big opportunities for upside over the next six months, the next year are elsewhere.
Mark, thanks so much. Uh, Mark Cudmore there in charge of our M Live blog, and I urge everyone to go and check it out on the Bloomberg Terminal. Now, stay with Bloomberg for special coverage of the Fed decision starting at 1.30 p.m. New York time today. That's 6.30 p.m. in London. We're on Dot Plot Watch. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lachlan, London. Matt Miller in Berlin. Katie Lines in New York. Now let's get straight to the Bloomberg First Word News. And the UK is said to be exploring joining the US MCA free trade agreement between the US, Mexico and Canada. Now it seems to be a recognition that the Biden administration won't start negotiations on a bilateral deal anytime soon. The UK is conducting negotiations around the world to replace its prior free trade treaty with the European Union. Now so far it has struck deals with the EU, Japan and Australia. President Biden is said to be planning to order 500 million Pfizer COVID vaccine doses to donate abroad. Now, sources tell us negotiations between the White House and manufacturers are continuing. A deal is poised to be unveiled at a virtual vaccine summit. Now, the order would double the number of Pfizer shots that the U.S. has bought for exports. However, it's not clear when the delivery would actually ship or how much it would cost. And finally, Bitcoin rallying after dropping briefly below 40,000 for the first time since August amid rising criticism from regulators. Now, the mood in the global markets has improved in part thanks to China calming market fears over Evergrande. Now, the largest cryptocurrency has broken a three-day losing streak after an earlier slide. I have to say, Matt, I know we look at daily movements and it's always interesting, but, you know, there are some existential threats about regulatory crackdown that could have huge implication going forward. They could, but also everyone could adopt cryptocurrency and that could have big implications as well. The thing I think is interesting is that Bitcoin has become really correlated with markets. Our producer in New York, Dan Curtis, put together this chart showing that, you know, when stocks go up, Bitcoin goes up too. Um, when it goes, when they go down, they both go down. The interesting thing could be um, that it looks like Bitcoin is more correlated with falling stocks than it is with rising stocks. So maybe they do worse in a market pullback. It's interesting, though, Matt. Bitcoin, in theory, is one of the riskiest of assets you could possibly invest in, given the volatility. So wouldn't it make sense that on risk off days, Bitcoin goes down and on risk on days, it goes up? Ah, pegging it yes. to fundamentals. <laughs> we'll get back to that. Coming up, we'll talk crypto maybe with Simon French, Panmure Gordon, chief economist. So this is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance, early edition. I'm Francine Lacroix in London, Matt Miller in Berlin, Kelly Lines in New York. Matt, a lot of the focus, of course, on Evergrande. We don't have that much clarity, but it seems that the markets have stabilized a little bit, maybe not the sell-off that we were expecting after two days of closures in Chinese markets. And then, of course, the focus on Fed. Yeah, we don't uh, have a ton of clarity. In fact, you could argue that we have even less clarity after the release from Evergrande saying that they've negotiated some sort of settlement with clearinghouses. It's not 100% uh, clear exactly which clearinghouses they mean, but um, we do have most of the biggest minds in markets saying the PBOC is going to step in here. China is going to do something to stave off an absolute catastrophe. So markets seem to be in agreement. Yeah, markets for the moment are kind of brushing off any kind of anxiousness, Kaylee. Yeah, it looks that way, Francine. Of course, they're also in a bit of a holding pan pattern ahead of the Federal Reserve decision coming up at 2 p.m. Eastern time. Right now, you are seeing the dip buying continuing in Europe. Stocks rising there for a second day. The stock 600 is off of session highs, but still up about six tenths of one percent, led higher by basic resources and energy. I'll have more on that in just a moment. Here in the U.S., we didn't really see the dip buying hold in yesterday's session, even though we opened higher. We saw some intraday selling today though, once again, futures are in positive territory, up about half a percent on S&P E-minis. So we'll see if that can hold today. In the bond market, steady as she goes as we await the Fed. This 10-year yield is sitting just south of 1.33%. South of and then, as I said, basic resources and energy outperforming in Europe, that is due to a rebound we're seeing in the commodity complex. The Bloomberg Commodity Index actually higher after a four-day losing streak. It's up about 1%. We're seeing pretty strong gains in the likes of metals like copper as well as oil. 
And that is leading to some positive activity in pre-market trading for commodity-related equities, both in terms of material stocks like Freeport, McMoran, and Alcoa, and energy names like Diamondback and Occidental Petroleum. All of them are higher in the range of 2 to 2.5% this morning, Matt. All right. Uh, good to get the morning movers there. I want to show you something that isn't really moving very much. This chart, and I'll uh, welcome our uh, Bloomberg radio listeners because you can't see it, but it's uh, pretty genius. It's elegant, I would say. I wish these charts were signed. I found this on the Bloomberg terminal. It looks like the work of David Inglis, but I'm not 100% <laughs> sure. What it shows is that markets, at least investment grade bond markets, are not freaking out about Evergrande because spreads haven't blown out at all. This is Asian US dollar denominated investment grade debt. And it looks like all is clear. Um, Simon French joins us now. He's a chief economist at Panamere Gordon. Simon, I will admit, as Mark Cudmore pointed out, that of course junk debt is freaking out, but then that's junk. Um, it doesn't seem like Evergrande is really worrying markets that much. Well, morning, Matt, and I agree with that analysis. Indeed, actually, if you look at the junk debt markets there, not only is an ice, it's isolated to China, it's also isolated to real estate. The broader high yield space in China hasn't seen those spreads widen, anything like that. But a good sense check of the sort of contagion risk is what has happened in European and US high yield markets. And you really have to squint at the high yield spreads to see any contagion risk at the moment, which I think is where we sit as regards the overall macroeconomic spillover. Yes, there will be targeted uh, pain delivered by you know, who, who holds the losses in the Chinese economy. But is this going to become systemic? Will the Chinese authorities allow that to happen? I think that's highly unlikely. I'm so excited of having Simon French in the studio. I could go over and hug you. Not allowed. Social distancing. When you look at what the Chinese authorities want to do, so first of all, do we know whether they, they have the money to intervene, even mm -hmm. if it's $300 billion? It, it, you know, politically, does it make sense for them to do so? Or is it also letting off a little bit of steam in the economy? Um, it's not binary. There will be a tolerance level in terms of how much uh, of a signal do the Chinese authorities want to give the real estate space in terms of getting the, the, the optimal amount of investment, which has been far out of kilter both with uh, developed and indeed emerging market norms in, in the recent past. But as soon as it starts to spill over into household incomes, savings, uh, of which of course is heavily exposed to the Chinese real estate, that tolerance level will be reached. And at that point, the corporate pain or the, the the specific pain will need to be dialed back to avoid a contagion with the Chinese uh, consumer spending space. Not all bond creditors are created equal. Is there a chance that actually they focus on, you know, yuan denominated debt, focus on Chinese investors, and say actually to hell with the rest? Well, so I think that is absolutely the most fascinating thing, not just on this story, but on a broader story in terms of if there is going to be turbulence in what now is an almost $300 trillion debt market around the world, if there's going to be targeted uh, haircuts, Mm. What will be the read across? What will people take from that as providing a precedent for other countries that may say, well, actually, all bondholders aren't made equal and we can find the legal and indeed the political uh, headway to start treating different holders differently? That would start to scare the markets. And yeah. I think that, therefore, is perhaps the biggest takeaway here. So, Simon, I have no doubt that there will be a question on China and Evergrande in the press conference for Jerome Powell later on today, but maybe it won't have too much of a bearing on the Fed's actual decision. What are you expecting in terms of a taper announcement and the dot plot? Yeah, so... Uh I think you're absolutely right. I think both the Evergrande issue and the broader sort of issues in, in corporate debt markets aren't going to really influence what we're going to hear from the Fed. I think the, there's actually a degree of continuity that we'll get. Despite a weak August payrolls number, I think there will be talking about talking about tapering will end and we'll be talking about tapering. <laughs> I think we think that now there's a November timeline in terms of the decision with a 15 billion taper probably month on month from December through to midsummer next year in terms of tapering that 120 billion of asset purchases down to zero. I think that perhaps the second order question in that is how does Jay Powell uh, stop markets then concluding as soon as that is done, we move straight to a rate hiking cycle. I think he'd yeah. like to generate some clear blue water and is why the dot plot, the second part of your question, is so key. I think the consensus of FOMC members will stay 
back end of 2022, early 2023, giving at least six months between the end of net asset purchases and the start of a rate hiking cycle. I, I wonder what your take is on the unemployment situation because uh, we're looking at the end of increased unemployment benefits and some companies are saying it's still incredibly difficult to find labor others you know uber is saying they've had an increase in the number of drivers signing up in the past couple weeks autozone um, says in the past five weeks or so they've had an easier time hiring people so there are specific examples of big companies saying now that um, you no longer get paid as much to stay home, people are coming in to look for a job. Yes, yeah, so we have anecdotes on both sides of the aisle, don't we? And I think that's reflective of the fact that demand has rotated uh, much quicker than supply can respond. And therefore, you have a mismatch, not just in the US labor market, but many labor markets around the world, a mismatch between where the demand has emerged and where the supply, which is more sticky, is slower to respond, uh, was pre-pandemic. But I also think, let's put some numbers on this, average additional jobs added in the United States economy around 630, 640,000 over the last six months. I think to achieve the full employment target that the Federal Reserve and indeed the Treasury want to see before starting a hiking cycle, we're probably about 10 million jobs light of that level. So even if we continue the last six months run rate, you're talking 18 months before you achieve that criteria. And let's be honest, that six month rate is going to slow as we approach that full employment level. So it's probably longer. If they're consistent to that full employment level, we are definitely back end of next year, early 2023, before the full employment criteria will be uh, achieved. Simon, thanks so much. We haven't even talked about Bank of England tomorrow. We'll get you back on to talk about that. Simon French there, Chief Economist at Panmure Gordon. Now, with only four days to go until Germany's general election, the Chancellor, Angela Merkel, has joined the campaign to give CDU candidate Armin Laschet a last-minute boost. Now, Goldman Sachs German Chief Executive Wolfgang Fink told us about what needs to be addressed by the new government. Clearly, companies are struggling with that and the cost of red tape to the to the corporate sector um, is, is, co uh, is constantly increasing. So that's certainly something very high on the agenda. And then, as you said, the green transition and the cost implied, but also the question as to clear rules and guidelines for corporates to safeguard their investments that are massive into green transition uh, is front and center. So that's where the new government will also have to address. For more, let's get straight to our reporter on the ground in Berlin, Maria Tadeo. So, Maria, first of all, the polls are getting closer. How much can Angela Merkel actually swing these undecided voters? Yes, and Francine, yesterday Angela Merkel was on the campaign trail, and that by itself tells you a lot, because at the beginning of this campaign, Angela Merkel was very clear that she did not want to get involved, that there needed to be a very clear distinction between Angela Merkel of the CDU and Angela Merkel, the Chancellor of Germany. Yesterday, she endorsed once again Armin Laschet, saying he is a man that will fight for every job in Germany. Now, what they're hoping is that some of that star power will stick with the CDU and provide propel them in the final weeks and, and days of campaigning, I should say. The, the issue, Francine, many of the Germans that I've spoken with, they tell me that this is a moment in which they really have to reconsider whether they vote for Angela Merkel or they vote for the CDU. And that could be a problem for the Christian Democrats. Having said that, behind the scenes, they say they still see a path to victory, that a lot of the silent voters will come out on Sunday for a much more, let's say, conservative, made in Germany, everything that the CDU stands for in terms of the economy, and that could lead them to a victory, especially because the polls are so tight. Yeah, tight, and it does look like the CDU is narrowing the gap. Is there still a path to victory for Lachette and the CDU? Well, uh, you know, again, you know, going back to that point, when you when you speak to members of the CDU, they say that there is still a way to make this happen. The polls are well, they polls. Have to yes, say that. Olaf Scholz done very well on the campaign, but ultimately, well, they have to say that, and is their spin on this, of course. But what they argue is that Germany is still a country that fundamentally, away from the big cities, continues to be middle Germany, very proud of its industry. Christian to that please well for a party that has Christian in uh, its name and that we will see a much tighter result than what they expect. Having said that, you're very right. If there was an election today and polls are right, it's Olaf Schultz and the SPD that would win and the CDU could very likely be kicked out of government. 
All right, Bloomberg's Maria Tadeo in Berlin. Thank you so much. And coming up, debt ceiling deja vu. As DC does the same old song and dance, U.S. Treasuries are still defying the S&P downgrade from 10 years ago. We'll have more on that next. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition, and you're looking live at the principal room. Coming up later today, the U.S. Special Presidential Envoy for Climate, John Kerry. Don't miss that interview. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Matt Miller in Berlin with Francine Lacroix in London. Now, a decade after taking the unprecedented step of downgrading the U.S. credit rating, Standard & Poor's shows no signs of reversing its decision, even as the U.S. credit outperforms every developed economy and prevails as the greatest magnet for global investors. That's the focus of Matt Winkler's latest column. Bloomberg's editor-in-chief emeritus joins us now with more on this. And Matt, I, th I find it fascinating um, that this hasn't been changed. And I wonder if it's because of the debt ceiling debate that seems now to come back over and over and over again that a, a rating agency like, like Standard & Poor's would believe there's a possibility the U.S. might not meet its obligations. Well, it's great to be with you, but the debt ceiling itself as an issue is essentially a ministerial function. So what that means is it's not tied to anything in particular. It's just something that has to get done, and it goes back decades. And probably the rating decision of a decade ago confuses politics with what you would call fundamental economics and investment. And the proof of that is, of course, that even when we got a hint that there might be a downgrade in July of 2011, actually treasuries were rallying into the S&P decision in August and continued to rally, of course, for much of the uh, past 10 years to the extent that interest rates are much lower today than they were before S&P downgraded the U.S. And as you rightly said, the U.S. actually has been the best performing, uh, if you like, debt economy among developed economies or developed nations and treasuries uh, if you bought them in 2011 the benchmark bond you have a total return today of 50 percent yeah so what does that tell us matt and good morning to you what does that tell us actually about you know how much more of an affected borrower the u.s has become well the demand for treasuries actually has continued unabated um, in fact if you look at what has happened there's been a greater supply of treasuries over the past 10 years, much greater, exponentially greater, and yet interest rates are actually much lower than they were uh, at the time that the S&P lowered its decision. The decision itself that we're looking at right now, the debt ceiling, again, is mostly ministerial. The Democrats, uh, who are controlling Congress and um, the White House and the Senate, actually have enough votes, uh, should they wish, to prevail here. And that's probably why the bond market today still is indifferent to this political crisis that uh, we're all talking about um, today. So how much does it matter, Matt, that uh, Standard & Poor's lowered its credit rating? And, and will they ever raise it back again? Well, uh, you know, far be it from me to answer that question for them. But you should look at it this way. Yet the U.S. isn't the only country that's been downgraded in the past 10 years. Japan, Finland, New Zealand, uh, France, to name a few. And in every instance, uh, the interest rate on their debt is lower than before they were downgraded. So this is, if you like, a repeat uh, decision uh, or repeat offender by the uh, rating company and it's essentially meaningless I mean when you get right down to it the bond market has completely ignored uh, the decision and in fact the bond market has used the S&P downgrade as a contrary indicator uh, Matt Winkler thank you so much on a great comment of course so joining us today uh, he is the Bloomberg News editor-in-chief emeritus now later today we'll also be speaking with the former Federal Reserve vice chair Alan Blinder that's at 1 30 p.m. in New York 6 30 p.m. in London and this is Bloomberg
got hit by the COVID coming. Um, and so then we bounced back from, from that. Supply chain problems that we're facing is very traditional economics 101. I see over the medium term, nine negative supply shocks are gonna reduce potential growth and increase cost of production over time. We are looking at inflation being more of a short to medium term issue. We didn't take as much risk as we could because we added, we added value, but not as much as we should have added. We're 24 seven buying and partnering with the market leaders who are leading digital transformation in their industries. A lot of the funds that we manage are taking much longer term bets. So we feel much less sensitive, you know, maybe to a change in policy. Well, top investors there speaking to Bloomberg's Tom Keen and Shanelle Bazak from the Greenwich Economic Forum. Tom Keen joins us now. Tom, great interviews. What did you learn that Evergrande is not Lehman Brothers until it goes well, the, under? The Greenwich Economic Forum's really got a force here. I mean, Ray Dalio providing leadership there with his with his focus on uh, Connecticut. But this is really something I think over the years they can build. There's a lot of smart people up there enjoying making and losing money. Mr. Dalio was very delicate about the challenges of Bridgewater, the challenges forward. It was just a great. It was a great event and. You know, the highlight of it, I didn't know this, but Mort behind me was a 110-footer uh, that was Matt Miller's. I didn't know that Matt had, you know, was, was <laughs> you know, had moved the boat up Miller there. Miller spending also. <clears throat> not yeah, in that video. Had it out. Yeah, not in that video was Ned Lamont, who's a wonderful guy. He's governor of Connecticut. He is truly from one of America's esteemed families. And this is a guy who's really dealt with the Connecticut distribution. Let's go to a chart, Francine, on Connecticut. This is to the north east of New York City for those internationally. And what's interesting here, going back on per capita income, is how Connecticut does better than the nation's average during financial crisis. That's clearly what we saw in 07, 08. But the disparity, Matt Miller, the disparity within yeah, Connecticut of Greenwich, 102,000, and Bridgeport, way less. It's remarkable the microcosm it is of the nation. Yeah, the, I mean, we were just talking about Bridgeport the other day with Alan Crawford. He wrote a big take piece on housing prices, even in that um, uh, underprivileged town. You've seen a huge jump in home yeah. prices. I, I I prefer to be on the other side of the New York border, although the problem there, of course, is that the taxes are so high. Well, in Connecticut, they're 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 sporting as well. He talked about that. Francine, it was a great great trip and. You know, a, a heron went over us. Francine, it's like you were there. There was a spiritual moment where this giant heron flew over us, and I missed a question to Ray Dalio. I'm sure, I mean, it, it sounds like a poem, actually, in the French about the heron. I had to learn it when I was seven, eight, and nine years old. I, I heard birds like chirping. La Fontaine. No, Tom, but, what, are you excited about the Fed? I, I, I am because no one is. I, I think it's really important to pay attention to central banks when it's boring, boring, boring. It's boring. Michael McKee, I'm sure, will provide some uh, interest in the press conference. All right. I'm quite excited about the Fed. Tom Keen, of course, co-anchor of Bloomberg Surveillance, and together with John Farrow and Kay Lines, they will also front who decides? a special on the Fed. Now, who the decides The Fed decides. What? Oh, the Fed decides. Everyone the decides decide. lately. Have you noticed that? Germany Germany's decides, deciding, the Fed decides. France. Yeah. yeah. Decides. Can we decide what we're watching later? I'm going to be watching Evergrande still because we didn't get any clarity um, recently. And actually, a viewer pointed out to me, um, it's not just about the bonds, but also they had a wealth management unit. So anyone who bought those products may be out that investment and you got to wonder how uh, President Xi and the PBOC are going to uh, meet the needs and obligations they have to their own citizens and allow everything else to kind of slide. Obviously, though, the collapse of a property developer isn't going to collapse the entire Chinese economy. So I think everything's going to be all right. Uh, nonetheless, <laughs> a pretty Matt, big famous hit. Famous last words. A pretty big hit. Yeah. Yeah. Famous last words. I mean, I guess the concern is that you don't really know exactly where the liabilities end. I know our dental is here in the UK has been looking China will be able to meet them if necessary. If they decide to. I mean, it's, of course, a political uh, question. We have seen, of course, this new injection from PBOC looking at, uh, of course, this cash injection 
uh, that won't last very long, but that's certainly helped stabilize the markets. Then the other thing, Matt, you and I were talking about it uh, the whole hour, it's uh, Fed tapering and the fact that it could be blindsided by not only the crackdown in China, but also debt ceiling politics. More Bloomberg surveillance coming up ahead. We'll hear from the Airbus chief executive, the World Bank president as well, amongst others. This is Bloomberg.